away from one another. I know you couldn't go to sleep tonight without knowing this stuff, okay? That's why I wanted to share it with you. And it's like, but even with this new info, it still gives no excuse for Lady Gaga and her hair. So that's a whole other story, though. Or have you ever wondered why we feel dizzy after we spin? You ever spin around, you know, and then you get done, and you're like, you still feel dizzy even though you're not spinning any longer? Well, if you're wondering, I looked up the answer for you yesterday. Our ears have tubes in them, and those tubes are filled with liquid. And when the liquid moves, it tells our brains what position our body is in. And when we spin, the liquid also starts spinning in those tubes. And when we stop, the liquid continues to spin. And our brain thinks that we're still spinning. That's why we feel like everything is still going in circles. Gee, all this time, I thought it was just MGS. Merry-go-round syndrome, I don't know, whatever. And then there's the hummingbird. It's the only bird that can fly upside down and backwards. They weigh less than a penny. Think about that, less than a penny. Plus, they can see and hear farther than any human can. Their hearts beat up to 1,260 times per minute, and their wings beat about 200 times per second. While driving at 60 miles an hour, they can move. Now, some have been known to migrate, these little hummingbirds, some 2,000 miles twice a year. Think about that. That's a long ways to go for a little tiny bird like that. And it takes a lot of food for them to energize that energy to fly that long. How much can a hummingbird eat? I knew you were asking that. They can eat, listen, eight times their body weight daily. I thought I had a huge appetite. That would be equivalent to me eating like 1,100 double-doubles a day. If I ate food like that, I'd look like a double-double, but that's a whole other story. Yes, without question, God made some incredible creatures that we that can cause us all to stop and look at them with total wonder and awe. That's why God said in Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes... His eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made, so that we are without excuse. God is saying, look, can you see everything that's been made? Can you see creation itself? He says, this screams of my glory, so that you have absolutely no excuse not to believe that there is a divine intelligence behind the creation. See, God is the creator of all things. We must realize everything that we see did not just randomly happen all on its own over the course of what now scientists say is 13.77 billion years ago. 13.77 billion years ago. Are they sure about that number? Where did they get that number? Did they pull it out of a Cracker Jacks box? I mean, are they sure it wasn't... 17.3 billion years ago? It wasn't 13.62 billion years ago? I mean, how could you get a number of such magnitude and say, oh, that's where it all began? See, there's no way that total chaos and complete disorder came into the incredible complexity and order that we see today all by itself. There's just no way. It'd be like saying, I took a little bit of broken glass, a little bit of stainless steel, a little bit of plastic, and I took it and I put it in a Yahtzee cup. And I shook it up and I rolled it out and bing, walla, bang, out come the iPhone. (laughs) It's like you'd be thinking, well, that's ridiculous. That could never happen. Well, exactly. That's the whole point. I mean, it'd be like saying that sometime a hurricane blew through a house, completely tore it to pieces, but in that house, in the coat closet, was a 2,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. And after the hurricane blew through, the jigsaw puzzle blew up and then came down and all landed all together. What? That's ridiculous. Again, of course it is. You never see total complexity come out of total chaos. Just like our complex human bodies didn't just randomly create themselves out of nothing. When we look back at the very first verse of the Bible, we see the glory of God. We see his power in him. And it says in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God, Elohim, he created the heavens and the earth. 
That's what the Bible says. That's how all of this came into order. Yes, the word created that God used there in the original language means, it comes from the Hebrew word bara, and it means he created it out of nothing. It means to create something out of complete nothing. Literally, God spoke everything into existence. God created the vastness of everything we see out of absolutely nothing. From the tiny hummingbird to the vastness of outer space. And how big is outer space? Well, scientists believe that planet Earth, the distance between planet Earth to the sun is about 93 million miles away. Now, 93 million miles away is just a fraction, a small fraction of a light year. Okay, so a light year, it's just a fraction of that. Well, outer space is believed to be 156 billion light years across. So the distance between us and the sun is just a minute fraction of one light year, and they say that across the universe is 156 billion light years. That's really, really big. And God created it out of nothing. Now, NASA and their scientists have estimated the creation of the earth to go back now 13.77 billion years. But yet, the scientists at NASA admit that they're not sure if their measuring system is accurate. I was talking to a young man just, you know, a a week and a half ago, and he was embracing this 13.77 billion years and how they come up with this number. I'm like, that's ridiculous. The the oldest known civilization is ancient day Egypt, and it's about 3,000 B.C. So it's like, how can we say something is 13.77 billion years old? And they said, oh, well, they've got this measuring system. So I went to NASA.gov. You know, and that's the website, nasa.gov. So I went there, and I read about all their technology and how they came up with this number, 13.77 billion years old. But again, what he didn't tell me, and what maybe he didn't know, is if you continue to read down the page, which I did, this is what they said about their number of 13.77 billion years old. They said this, quote, taken just from their website and just printed on here. Copy, paste. It's a great thing. It says this, quote, if we compare the two age determinations, there is a potential crisis. Uh, Do you think so? Yeah, I think so. If the universe is flat and dominated by ordinary or dark matter, the age of the universe as inferred by the Hubble constant would be about 9 billion years old. The age of the universe would be shorter than the age of the oldest stars. This is a contradiction, and it implies that either, so it's going to give us three reasons of why. Number one, our measurement of the Hubble constant is incorrect. Yeah, you think? Okay. Number two, the Big Bang Theory is incorrect. Hmm, okay. Number three, that we need a form of matter like cosmological constant. That's the science or origin of time and space. That implies an older age for a given observed expansion rate. Yeah, here, I I got number four for you. Here's number four. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah, that's it. How about that? See, the bottom line, and they even say it on their own webpage, the bottom line is this is theory. It's conjuncture. It's guesswork. They simply cannot know for sure. And for those who believe that that just creation made itself, that these complex human bodies that we have were just evolving over millions of years, turning into a monkey, and somehow we are the great intelligent beings that we are today, this is what God has to say to them. In Romans chapter 1, he says, You have professed yourself to be wise, but by what you said, you have become a fool. You have become a fool. This morning, we will have, you know, our third and final message here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In part one, we looked at the facts of the resurrection. First, that Jesus Christ literally died on the cross. No, the second thing we looked at was that he was buried in a grave. And the third thing is that he physically rose again from the dead. Yes, Jesus was publicly sentenced to death by a real Roman governor, not some fictitious person, 
This was a real governor of Rome. His name was Pontius Pilate. His death warrant was carried out by real Roman soldiers. Jesus was seen dead on the cross at Golgotha. This is a historical fact. He was placed there in a grave, historical fact, and many eyewitnesses watched it. And then, of course, on the third day, under the close eye of a Roman guard of soldiers, Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. Then he was seen by Peter, John, James, and the other apostles, along with over 500 people at one time. Hundreds of people seen Jesus alive. Jesus, after he rose again from the dead, still walked on the earth for another 40 days. He was seen by tons of people. And the writer points out, at the time of the recording of this letter, which is only 22 years after Jesus rose from the dead. So this letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians, was penned 22 years after Jesus rose from the dead. Most of the people that watched him, that saw him, that talked with him, they all saw him resurrected. They saw Jesus with their own eyes, and guess what? They're still alive. They're alive, every one of them. This could not be denied. And then in our second study, we looked at who would be resurrected, and that would be all those who have asked Jesus Christ into their hearts as their Savior. Every one of them. See, these people, it's like, these people that ask Christ in their heart as their Savior, those are the ones that are going to go to heaven. We looked at those are the ones who will be re- resurrected. And when will it happen? We as believers will go to heaven when? When we die. And the Bible says it's appointed for each man to die once, and after this comes judgment. So we will go into the presence of God. We will die one day, but that's when we go to heaven. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, it says this, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So our last breath here will be followed by our first breath in heaven. And for those of us who are alive today, we looked at the rapture of the church last week in detail. That's when the true believers will be caught up instantly to be with the Lord. That appears to be the next event on the prophetic calendar of the Bible. And we will look at that a little more here this morning. And finally, last week, we looked at how we should live until Jesus comes back. Specifically, not to hang out with non-believers. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I have to quit my job. Why? Because I work with a bunch of heathens. No, listen, we are the lights that shine in this dark world that we live in. So we're supposed to be the light that shines amongst other people that are not believers. But what he's talking about here specifically is that we are not to take our personal time and have our personal close friendships with those that don't know Jesus Christ. That's why he said in verse 33, bad company corrupts good morals. And again, uh, and he said that in also in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, not to be unequally yoked with non-believers. But now here this, this afternoon as we finish chapter 15, we will consider three points in light of our title. How does that work? Number one, the glory to come. Number two, the power of the resurrection. And number three, the victory over death. So let's look at our, our first point here, the glory to come, as we read together uh, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 35. He says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? These are people that don't believe in the resurrection. And with what kind of a body do they come? You fool, Paul says, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body, just as he wished, and to each of his seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. 
Okay, so it's a little, you know, kind of choppy there. Okay, what's he saying here exactly? Well, let's just kind of take it apart here one step at a time. Now, notice in verse 35, Paul once again addresses those who mock the very thought of the resurrection, just as he's done in other places in the Bible, like when he stood in the amphitheater next to the Mediterranean Sea at Caesarea. Been there several times. This is an incredible place. This is where he was preaching the gospel to King Agrippa. When he said in Acts 26, verse 8, he says, Why is it considered incredible among your people if God raises the dead? Because people were saying, hey, listen, you just live. You know, you just live, and then when you're dead, you're dead. You go into the grave, that's it, it's over. Your bird food, whatever, your, you know, your, your, your plant moss, whatever you are. But it's like that's not the case. Paul was saying there is a resurrection. When you die, you will live again. You will either live in heaven or you will live in hell. It's like, which one will you live in? So Paul was making a point here. Paul was saying this is not some new random thought here. This has been the hope of God's people all the way from the beginning. Listen to what is believed to be one of the oldest books of the Bible. Listen to what it says here. This is before Abraham. This is before Moses. He says in Job 19, uh, 19 verse 25, he says, As for me, Job was saying, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth, even after my skin is destroyed. Yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes shall see, and not another. Job was prompted to say these things because, as you know, Satan has given permission, was given permission here to do what? Satan was given permission to afflict Job, to see where his faith was. And after losing his family and everything that he had, he said in Job 121, he says, Naked I came I from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord is given, and the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, after this, you know, what we know is Job's comforters came to him. They became more like Job's afflictors. For they accused Job of some sort of secret sin. And that's why God's hand of judgment was on him. When in all actuality, it was quite the opposite. Satan was actually mocking Job's faith. And he was telling God that the only reason that Job worships you, God, is because you blessed him so much. Well, that's what led to Job saying these incredible words that were found in chapter 19. He said, look, no matter what happens to me, no matter what happens to this life, eventually I die. And when I die, I know my Redeemer lives. He says, I know that when I die one day, I'm going to see God. And that God would vindicate his life. You know, and he said, better translated, in his resurrected body. Yes, this has been the hope of God's people all the way from the beginning. It was David, the giant slayer. You know him, King David, the man after God's own heart. At one point, his infant child son was very sick at the brink of death. David went into a panic mode. He was praying, oh God, spare this baby boy. Spare him. Spare his life. Spare everything about him. He wouldn't bathe. He wouldn't eat. And he's like, oh God, please have mercy on this little boy. And his servants were watching him. Oh man, the king's not eating. The king's just, and he's on his face before God. All of these things. And then finally the day came. God had chosen not to eat. Not, I mean, not to eat, but not to heal the little baby. God had chosen not to heal him, and the baby had died. The servants didn't want to tell David. The, the servants were afraid. They were sitting there saying, hey, what are we going to do? Man, the boss, the king, he hasn't ate. He hasn't bathed. When he hears this, he's going to go over the deep end. And he, David heard the servants talking, and he said, did the baby die? And they said, yes. He says, run me a bath. Give me some food. And they're thinking, what? It's like when the baby was sick, you wouldn't eat. You wouldn't bathe. 
He says, yes, I know. And I was praying that God would have mercy. But God has chosen not to heal the baby. And then he goes on to say this in 2 Samuel 12, 23. Can I bring him back again? He asked the question, can I bring him back? Of course I can. But I shall go to him. He cannot return to me, but I will go to him. See, David was assured of the resurrection. He knew that one day when he died, he would go into the presence of God, to the very place where this baby was. What words of encouragement that is to each and every one of us that have lost a loved one that knew Christ. You will see them again. You will stand in their presence. There will be a reunion. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that was always kind of an odd verse to me. And I never allowed odd verses to stumble my faith. You know, things that I didn't understand. Because I always knew this. I knew that God was real. And I knew that he loved me. And so if I read something in the Bible and it didn't make sense to me, I didn't allow it to go, oh, geez, let me just take my faith and toss it in a trash can. I'd always have to take a step back and just realize, I know God loves me, and I just there's something I don't understand here. So I would take it in a little file in my mind, and I would stick it in the file and close the door. You know, it's like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll check you out another time later. Well, I did that with one of these verses. It was in Psalm 116, verse 15. And when I first read it, I didn't understand it. Because it says this, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his holy ones. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his holy ones? What's so precious about that? That didn't sound too precious to me. I don't get this. So I stuck it in a little file and I just closed it. But after about 20 years of being a Christian, 25 years, 30 years, all of a sudden I really started thinking about that verse. Wow, what a beautiful verse it is. Precious In the sight of the Lord is the death of his holy ones. Because now we get to stand in his presence. We're no longer separated from him. Now we we become in his view. We get to touch him. We get to talk with him. No longer do we have a sin nature. No longer do we have our struggles. No longer is there any sin or darkness in our life. But now we become everything that he's called us to be. See, that is the true circle of life. It's not like what they say in The Lion King. Sorry, don't want to dash your, you know, thoughts here. But Walt Disney didn't have it all figured out. But what God does is he has it figured out. And he says this, this is the full circle of life. When God first created Adam and Eve, he created them in his image, and he put them in the Garden of Eden. Eden means paradise. So God created Adam and Eve. He puts them in paradise. They were going to live forever. They had no sin nature. There was only one rule in the garden. There wasn't Ten Commandments. Just don't eat of this one tree. Well, you know the story. They ate of the forbidden fruit. We've been eating of the forbidden fruit ever since. But when they ate of the forbidden fruit, they died spiritually. No longer were they going to live forever in those spiritual bodies. They died spiritually, and they were what? Booted out of the Garden of Eden, the place of paradise. What happens to the true believer when they die? They go to heaven. Where's that? Paradise. What happens to us? We get a new body. And it's going to live forever. It has no sin nature in it. We never sin again. And we stand in the presence of God. Because God used to come down in the cool of the day and hang out with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So the full circle is we go right back to what it was supposed to be. In paradise with God and going to live forever. That's the true circle. Yes, all through the Bible, the resurrection of believers is taught. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 22. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of the living, not the dead. And Paul moves on to give us an example of how God uses the same mentality in nature. He said in verse 36 to 38 that seeds, when planned, when planted, actually die. So he's given us a little history lesson here on what actually happens when plants grow. They decompose, the seed does, and it ceases to live as a seed. Yet when that seed dies, it springs up new life into a living plant that would grow into a possible tree and produce fruit. So one seed that does nothing all on its own, if you plant it in the ground and it grows like an orange seed, could grow a whole nother orange tree that could produce thousands of oranges in its life. Yes, 
You know, he goes on to say that there's different seeds and there's different bodies. There was bodies of animals and bodies of birds and bodies of fish in verse 39. But then he brings it all home. Like, what are you actually talking about here? When he says in verse 40, there are earthly bodies and there's heavenly bodies. And they both have their own glory. Now, certainly, these earthly bodies have their measure of glory. We were made in the image of God. We are made in his image. Think about how complex we are. We're a living being. We breathe. We think. We see. We communicate. I mean, we walk and we talk. We can smell. We can taste. We can reason with one another. And more importantly, we can know our maker. Yet in our earthly bodies, we have limitations when it comes to our relationship with the living God. We cannot fully realize who he is or fully understand him until we see him face to face. Because as you remember in our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, it said this, for now we see through a mirror dimly. He says, you know, we're a little foggy right now on how everything works. Just a little foggy. He says, but then we will see him face to face. Now I know him in part, but then I will know him fully as he fully knows me. Yes, there is a glory in these earthly bodies, but there will be a serious glory at a whole nother level that is when we see him in our spiritual bodies, when we receive the heavenly body. How so? Well, for example, we will see God face to face. We will touch him, which brings up our second point, the power in the resurrection, the power in the resurrection. Let's pick up again in verse 42. And it says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in a perishable body, but it is raised in an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam, which he, of course, talked about this in our first study in chapter 15, the last Adam is Jesus, and he became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. Then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthly. The second man is from heaven, as is earthly. So also are those who are earthly, and as is the heavenly. So also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Wow. Yes, there is power in the resurrected body. We are sown. We are sown. We're born in a perishable body, meaning our bodies have a shelf life. Our bodies have a shelf life. We're going to wear out. And you know this. I mean, back when I was like, I don't know, let me see, uh, you know, 12 years old, 15 years old. I mean, I thought someone that was my age was like, you are so old, you're like older than dirt. Well, now that I'm that old, I'm like, well, you know, I don't know. I guess I am kind of old as dirt. But the thing is, we have a shelf life. I used to be able to play five courts of basketball, full court, man, and I'd get up the next day, I wouldn't even think twice about it. But now I play like three, you know, games of full court basketball, and I'm like, the next morning is like, oh, I got to get out of bed? Are you serious? Yes, this body has a shelf life. It's going to wear out. We're going to die. We have been sown in dishonor, meaning we were born in sin, and because of that, we're weak in the flesh. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall, because these bodies are subject to sin. So if you ever sit there and say, I'll never do what that guy did. I'll never sin like that. Oh, the Bible says be careful, because if you who think you stand, you could fall yourself. So when you point your finger at one person, remember you got three little piggies coming back at you. So we could all fall. That's why we have feet of clay. And Jesus said this in Mark 14, 38. He said, keep watching and praying 
that you may not come into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yes, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That means that, yeah, we want to do what's right. We want to do what needs to be done. But yet we have to, at this point, understand that that, even though we want to do what's right, we could still fall at any given moment because the flesh is weak. Yes, without question, our bodies will all perish one day. It will perish. Yet until we perish, we can have times of great, of great weaknesses, both morally and spiritually. But in the day of our resurrection, when this body is put off and our new imperishable body as Christians is put on, all of a sudden everything will change, meaning we will live forever at that point. Our new body will not be subject to sickness or disease any longer, nor will it be affected by any of the age restraints. We will be raised in honor, the Bible says. We will no longer have a sin nature. We will no longer be subject to sin against our God. Temptation will no longer have a foothold in us. It will be a thing of the past. No more addictions. No more attitudes. No more struggles. What a day that will be. We will be raised in power, the Bible says. That word power that's given here is from the original Greek word dunamis. It's where we get our English word dynamite. And that's what God is going to give us. It's a miraculous power in the resurrected body. One that's filled with ability. And one that's filled with abundance. No longer will we have any weaknesses. Yes, Through Adam and his eating of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, we were born naturally. And it was through Adam in verse 45 that God made the first man a living soul. Yet it went on to say that through Jesus, he is a life-giving spirit. Yes, Jesus has given us the promise of true life. Imagine that. Life. Life in the here and now. Jesus says, I came to give you life abundantly, along with a real life that will make this life look like it's walking dead, like we're a bunch of zombies here or something, because the life to come in the resurrection is a life that will never end. Yes, life will be sweet in the next life, but he still has come to give us life abundantly, even here, like it says in verse 49. Our first birth is the image of the earthly, yet our next life will bear the image of the heavenly. Which brings up our third and final point here, the victory over death. Let's read again here, picking up in verse 50. And he says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, listen, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, because of these things, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Wow, what a rich portion of Scripture that is. Notice how Paul finished. He's emphatic about his defense of the resurrection. He's non-wavering. He is solid. And he so eloquently separates the natural body from our heavenly body to come. Now he makes sure that the world knows in verse 50 that the natural man, the man of flesh and blood, will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
just like Jesus said at the beginning of his earthly ministry. He said this, remember when he talked to Nicodemus? Now, Nicodemus was probably the most religious man there was at the time. He was a Pharisee of the highest order of religiosity of the day. He was part of the Sanhedrin, part of the people who actually were the law in Jerusalem. And Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, the first showing of Nick at night. But that's a whole other story. But anyway, Nicodemus came and he says, good teacher, nobody can do the things that you do. I've been watching you. Man, you're doing all this miracle stuff. Something is with you. And Jesus gets up and looks at him in the eye and says, you must be born again. Listen, Nicodemus, are you not the teacher in Israel? Don't you know these things? You're not going to go to heaven because you're religious. You're not going to go to heaven because of your religiosity. You're not going to go to heaven because you're a good person. You must be born again or you will not see the kingdom of heaven. That term born again means born anew. It means born from above. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Nobody can on planet earth. Doesn't matter how much you give to cancer research. Doesn't matter how much you recycle. Doesn't matter how much you're a good person. You cannot go to heaven outside of being born again. That's what Jesus said. And again, we are testified to that here in our text. You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You must humble ourselves. We must humble ourselves before the living God. We must repent of our sins. We must ask Jesus Christ to come into our hearts as our Lord and our Savior. And when we do, Paul shares the mystery with us. What was that mystery? We looked at it last week in detail. And he said it again here in verse 50 and 51, that some of us will not die. We will not actually have a physical death, for the Lord is going to come back. He says there, in a twinkling of an eye, we will be taken away. Again, this is the rapture of the church. When all true believers are removed from the earth to be forever with the Lord. This could happen at any given moment. This is what God will use to trigger the end of the world. For after this event, that is the rapture of the church, when the true church is removed. I'm not talking about all these religious edifices that we see, all these buildings with crosses on them and stained glass windows and what have you. It doesn't matter how much it looks like a church. And what matters is what are the people like on the inside. Have they asked Jesus Christ into their heart? Because listen, the church is not the building. It's not this building. It's not our new building. The church is you. The people are the church. And Jesus is the head of the church. It's the body of believers. And once the church is removed, that begins to stop. Watch. Click. click, Because then there's seven years left on planet earth. Seven years. Because Daniel the prophet in the Old Testament testified of the 70th week. And when that seven-year period happens, that's the end of time. But that that seven-year period does not begin until the rapture of the church. But once the true believers are pulled away, that will begin the apocalypse, which will lead to the battle of Armageddon. But know this, those who are in Christ, we will be removed first before all those horrific events take place. That's a promise from the scripture. And then we are removed and our perishable bodies are exchanged for imperishable bodies. That's when Paul quotes the Old Testament book of Hosea in chapter 13, verse 14. He quotes them in verses 54 and 55. He says, death is swallowed up in victory. Death has lost its sting. Paul uses the terminology of a bee. Losing its stinger. And as you know, if a bee loses its stinger, it can no longer sting you. And he no longer is a threat to you. Understand, the sting of death is sin. Sin is the sting of death. Why? Because every person has sinned before God. God is holy and we have sin that separates us from him. That's why God says, it's not that my hand's short that I can't reach you. It's not that my ear's dull that I can't hear you, but your sin has made a separation between you and me. And if we die in our sin, 
if any human being dies in their sin, they will be judged by the law of God. And the law of God is perfect. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died in our place because we're not perfect. He took our judgment that should have been laid upon us, upon his body. Jesus was sinless. Why? Because he was the God-man. He was fully God and fully man at the same time. And he came to pay your sin and my sin on his body on the cross. Meaning, he took our judgment upon himself. The judgment that was supposed to fall on you and me. How exactly does that play out? Because you know and I know that we're still not perfect, right? We're, we still have this little bit of riffraff that's, you know, cruising around in there, okay? So how does this work out? How does it play out? I love that verse in Romans chapter 3. He explains it all. He says in verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, here's fact. Number one, everyone sinned. You say, well, yeah, but I'm not as bad as that guy. It doesn't matter. You're still sin. You know, some people are like, well, yeah, well, I just have a few boo-boos. Well, boo-boos are sin. Sorry. Everyone sins, whether it's this much or it's this much. We've all sinned. We come short of the glory of God. Verse 24 says in Romans 3, being justified as a gift. God justified us as a gift. What does justified mean? Justified literally means he's made you just as if you never sinned. Think of the magnitude of that. When you ask Jesus in your life, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, but yet he justifies us. He made us as if we didn't sin. We all know we did. We all know we're guilty. But he made us as if we didn't sin. And why did he do it? He went on to say, by his grace. His grace means God's unmerited favor. You you didn't merit the favor. He just did it because he loves you. It's his favor. And he says, through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Then he explains it all the way in verse 31 of Romans 3. He says then, well, do we nullify the law through faith? So because we came to Jesus by faith, do we just say, oh, well, the law doesn't exist anymore? No. He says, may it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. We say that the law is true. The law of God, it says right and wrong. We establish that that's true. See, he ended with, we don't nullify it. We don't neglect the law of God. Then what do we do? See, the law, we establish it because the law says what? Pay me. When you break the law, what happens? Pay me. You get a parking ticket, pay me. You get a speeding ticket, pay me. You get one of these little photo light things, pay me a lot of money, okay? It's like a 401k plan. Just switch it over to us, okay? So, you know, the law says pay me. Well, God's law says the same thing. You sinned, pay me. You're like, well, how much do I have to pay? Gazillions of dollars. I don't have gazillions of dollars. It's like, well, that's what it's going to cost. Well, it's more than I could ever pay. That's right. You could never do enough to pay that. You could never do enough. In steps Jesus. I'll pay it. It's gazillions of dollars. It's all right. I have enough. And he pays your debt. And he wipes it away. So the law, what happens? The law is upheld, right? Because the law was paid. It was paid. He paid your debt. The law is upheld. The law is not weakened. It was paid. Your debt was paid. And we, the sinner, were redeemed and were saved. The law is upheld and we are redeemed. Yes, we have been given power over sin and death. Know this, we are no longer slaves to sin. Then why do we sin? Well, I think the book of James sums it up pretty easy why we sin. James 1.14 says, But each one is tempted when he is carried away by his own lust. He's enticed by his own lust. And when the lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. That's why we need to focus on the last verse of this chapter. Because when we don't focus on the last verse of this chapter... Then we just start thinking about ourselves and what can I do and where can I go and, ooh, that looks kind of nice over there. And, and then we get enticed. And then our lust gets all stirred up. Look, we all have a lust for something, do we not? We all have a weakness. Maybe you have two or three weaknesses and you need to work on those. But we all have at least something that we're subject to. We fly off the temper, we do this, and we feel good about it. I told them where to go, and I felt good about it. It's like, oh, yeah? Well, we all have that thing that can draw us away. 
But in the last verse of this chapter, he says, therefore. Again, what's the therefore? Therefore, because of everything that he just said. He says, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Stay on the straight and narrow. Be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. It's time for us Christians to rise up, to be the light that shines in this dark world. We as Christians need to keep the main thing, the main thing. And what is that? Being lights to shine in this dark world. Because one day soon, brothers and sisters, it's going to be over. Jesus is going to come back. He's going to take us away. And everything that's going to happen in this world is going to happen. But we're going to be in heaven. One day, this mortal body will put on immortality. We will have a new body and we'll stand in the presence of God. So until then, be about your Father's business. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you, Lord, and thank you so much for this great love that you have for us. And God, as we close here this morning, this afternoon, I pray, God, that you would speak and touch each and every heart here today with a desire and a passion, Lord, to become everything you want us to be. Because if the non-believer doesn't hear from us, who are they going to hear from? Peter Pan? Oh, he's make-believe. The agnostics? The evolutionists? The atheists? No. They need to hear from us, your children, that there's a way to heaven, that we could cry out that there's a redeemer that wants to forgive us of our sin. Maybe you're here this morning you were brought by a friend. Maybe you were driving by. But maybe you don't know that you know that you're going to 